celebrating its 95th anniversary in a year, I think. So we feel this is a really special place, a very sacred place. So welcome to you. And we're sorry that uh, the other poet couldn't come. He has COVID. So you're gonna, we'll get even more poetry from this. <laughs> so welcome, and welcome to the people who are here on Zoom. to the earlier and to James for helping us organize this. I'm really excited to be here. I love this bookshop. And um, so my cha my chapbook, Naya Blood, uh, was published last fall, and it's my first collection of poetry. And so I'm really excited to share it with you tonight. Um, so my first poem that I'm going to read is about uh, growing up in Long Island during the summer. Um, I write a lot about my childhood and spending time at my grandfather's house in Southwold on the North Fork of Long Island in New York. So this poem is called Peconic Summers. Okay, yes, I'm in love with jingle shells and jellyfish, but I'm talking about the see-through ones that aren't pink and don't sting, the ones that drag shadows like dark freckles in the shallows, the ones that make you shudder when you touch their gooey ghosts. I'm talking about sea robins, blowfish and sand sharks and porgies, skates and horseshoe crabs, things you catch off your grandfather's boat before you jump off and paddle to the beach where mom sits in a chair that we've had since the 60s. I'm talking about a road south of the harbor where we swim across a channel our annual migration to the white point of land that juts out like a chin into Caribbean blue water. I'm talking about a farmhouse, a rope swing with a tractor tire, wooden Adirondack chairs and gas lanterns on tables with sunflowers, sweet corn on the cob and barefoot children running beneath the stars. I'm talking about hammocks, rocking chairs and chalk drawings on the driveway, a garage full of bicycles, a blue and white house a porch with a view. It's all about laughter floating through an open window on a summer firefly night, up into the black like Chinese lanterns, fading. That was the first one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you can't tell, I really love that place, and it's inspired me a lot. Um, so yeah, so I grew up by the ocean. Um, I grew up in Manchester by the sea on the North Shore of Massachusetts, um, along with spending time in Long Island. And, but when I went to college, um, I walked on the women's crew team at Trinity College in Connecticut. And that completely changed my life because I saw the water in a whole new way. Um, and that's honestly what this book is about <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, so I'm going to read this next poem. 
And this poem, it's called A Life Through Boats 3. It's part of a series. This is the last poem in the series. Uh, the first poem in the series talks about, um, like, sailing um, in Manchester, which is one form of the boat. Uh, one of the poem, the other poem is about like the ferry rides from back and forth to Long Island in Massachusetts. That's another kind of boat. But then this is the last kind of boat that I talk about um, in this series. So, A Life Through Boats 3. To the ruffian, spectacular bid, craft, unbowed, Aladar, A4+, plus, and Z4+. Plus. I came to rowing, lanky, wide-eyed, the skin on my hands, soft. I was a girl raised by the sea. I thought I knew the water. I thought I was a woman. But she appeared only after I popped my first blister. After the calluses on my palms turned yellow. After I couldn't see my toes past my thighs, learned to lift weights, boats, to win silver medals under blinding skies. My bones as strong as the carbon fiber that held me. The woman I became first breathed on a seat that barely spans the width of my hips, sliding, unstable, an oar in my hands that seemed more like a javelin. The rigor on my right side, wing-like, my blade one feather out of many. I am a passenger, a single cog in your engine, but something greater within all of us feeds you. We, you ride on those inner winds, intangible, yet stronger than any machine. Uh, yeah, so this was kind of my introduction to the sport of rowing, and it was a big learning curve. Um, I had no prior experience with the sport, but I ended up falling deeply, deeply in love with it. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so, this next poem I'm going to read. Uh, I think I'll read this one. Uh, it's called If Persephone Rode, and hopefully it'll hit home in this cold climate we're living in right now. Um, and Persephone, of course, is the goddess of spring in Greek mythology. I take a lot of inspiration from Greek mythology in my work as well. I will say this poem as well, it is a double high bun, so a high bun is when you have a prose um, poem, like prose stanza, and then a haiku, so it's a double version of that. <laughs> if Persephone Road. Nothing says winter like hands, aching for oars, creased, dry, cracked, itching to dip a blade and glide across that glass. The rower looks out from the bridge into frosty stillness. The river, a reptile, splintered in arctic scales, dormant in the cold. Hibernation, the word an old man chants as he ergs in a snowstorm. A swan stands on ice, neck bent, sees its reflection. The cityscape looms. Spring is the sight of three shells, first of the season on the river. Anyone whose road stops in their tracks on the bridge, turns, watches, been waiting so long for this moment, the boat bay doors open. Even if there's still snow on the banks, birds in the water, the call to home, hard to ignore. It's the skin, knowing its softness won't last, a tingling in the fingertips. Purple palms, dead scabs, drachmas. Blisters bloom, pink, red, hardened, leather gloves. Yeah, so in a way, after reading that poem, I also realized that rowing really shifted my perspective of how I see the world. Like, spring is a very common topic to write about <laughs> in poetry, and I kind of liked, I like to reimagine it through this lens, and I try to do that a lot in my own poetry, 
so that was kind of an experiment. Um, um, so this next poem I'm going to read, <laughs> uh, it's called The Seat Race, and it does feature one of my former teammates rather prominently, and only recently had she just discovered that it actually was about her. <laughs> um, and so Livia and I were talking about this yesterday, like, how do you navigate, uh, you know, telling someone that they inspired you and that you're writing about them? Um, it's kind of like with nonfiction. If you write about someone who is still living today and that you know, and if you publish a piece about them, like what, at what extent, at what point do you tell them? <laughs> um, so now she knows, but <laughs> she might have been a little surprised. Um, I swear she, she's an amazing person and the nicest person you'll ever meet. I describe her in a little bit of a scary way, um, but she really, really inspired me when I was on the team. So, uh, and if you don't know what a seat race is in rowing, um, basically it's, it's a process where it happens within the team, um, and in order to determine who sits in the top boat and who moves the boats the fastest, you race each other in order to see who can be in the top boat. Um, so, <laughs> this poem is called The Seat Race. Chains clank as the bay doors open. Coaches load gas tanks and grocery carts, tow them down the asphalt slope. A pack of tightly clad bodies carries oars, launches on rollers, jostles and yips up the hill. The sun rises, though not a hand touches a boat. Every season, a time comes when coaches talk selection. Hackles stand at the word. Ears flatten, tails tuck between thighs, eyes watch each other. Walk-ons get skittish. Juniors crack their joints, paw the ground and snort. Recruits pick their teeth, they know the drill. Some feel safe, others fear for their seat. But at the apex of any team lies a single rower, a predator in her prime. Five feet, 10 inches of lean, toned ego. Hair twitching like the tail of a Frisian horse, built for speed and breaking records. Look directly in her eye and she snaps, jaw unhinged, saliva streaming from her fangs, so hungry she could eat a coxswain. Challenge her for a spot in the top crew, and before the boats hit the water, she spreads her arms, protracts her claws, licks her lips, and grins. <laughs> like I said, she's a nice person. <laughs> um, she definitely is an amazing athlete and really goes after it. Um, and that was really what I was trying to get across in that poem. And also Dan Tobin, our professor at Emerson, really gave me the idea of, um, like when I was writing that poem, no one knew what seat racing was. And so I kind of had to navigate, how do, I, how do I make this more relatable to a non-growing audience? Like, and one of the ideas that he had was, you know, talk about natural selection. <laughs> uh, that kind of, and that seemed to tie in really well with, um, with the, the process that I was explaining there. Um, how are we doing on time? Um, I think I'm going to read uh, this poem. This was my first published poem. Um, and I wrote it in college. I wrote most of these poems as an undergrad, but some of this collection has some newer poems from my graduate experience as well. Um, but this one, uh, I'm really proud of it, so I'll, I'll give you guys a read. It's called Duende, and for those of you, I see some nodding heads. Duende is a Spanish term, and the way I like to think of it is um, it describes the feeling you get when you look at a piece of art and you get goosebumps. That's kind of how I like to think of it. And it starts with um, a quote here from George Yeomans Pocock, who's a famous boat builder. It's a great art is rowing. It's the finest art there is. And when you're rowing well, why, it's nearing perfection. 
and when you near perfection, you're touching the divine. We rowers have peculiar rituals, like running stairs and doors, inhaling stale air and dust, like sweating in a tank room, all concrete walls and low ceiling, mirrors and machines, our suffering artificial. While we labor in these confines, we pray in wintertime for blue skies, flat water, for the sun. We see in our minds that pavement path that slopes downward to the river. On one shoulder, our dark craft, we make our morning pilgrimage. Salute the waning moon, the dawn. First light ricochets off water, the fragments shower our foggy faces. It's the thing that fully wakes us, makes the naiad flood in any girl sing. On land, we abandon our bodies, discard our separate shells in exchange for a new vessel. The moment the last foot leaves the dock, an unearthly link completes itself. On water, our souls surrender, affixed to that greater whole, that oneness. At the risk of becoming gods ourselves, we glide through the waves, our togetherness the only thing that anchors us. Yeah, that's about as religious as I get. <laughs> uh, but honestly, like I, as I learned the sport of rowing, the spiritual aspect is really what hit me. Being on the water, like that, that part is the part that I fell in love with. Not being inside, being on the machines, being on the ergs. Like that's, that was the hard part. The fun part and the rewarding part was mm -hmm. being outside in nature. Um, and also with the people in the boat. That was another big part of it. Uh, I think I'm going to read... I'll read this one. So, living in Boston, it's been really great because obviously rowing is a big part of the culture here. How did the Charles happens? It happened last fall, thankfully. Um, you know, during the pandemic, it was able to happen. It got canceled the year before. I was actually able to race it last fall with uh, an alumni boat from Trinity, and it was really, really fun. Um, so this poem is, is inspired by the Head of the Charles race. It's called On the Eve of Rower's Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the city, rowers lay tucked in their beds. Their presences, heavy, pulsate-like lights in the buildings. Soft-footed coxswains watch over their broods, race plans and moves, dance in drowsy minds. Boats hum in slumber, oars thirst for calloused hands, and the river ripples, dark, quiet. People from lands far and wide will journey to these banks to celebrate the birth of a god named Charles. They send prayers for good weather for this coming dawn, in which they will rise immune to the cold of late October. People will gather on the bridges, greeting teammates of years past as if no time lay between them, their voices ringing like bells above the ships that propel beneath them. The entrancing magic of an oar, as it cuts through water, brings them home again and again on this day. The white crest of backsplash, a gift, a reminder of what it is to be young and old and strong. Yeah, I get goosebumps just reading that. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe I'll do one or two more. Okay. Um, I could read my whole book at this rate. <laughs> um, I think that I'm going to read this one. Um, this is called Obad for the River. 
Obad is a poem um, about the morning time, and it was originally about like when lovers <clears throat> have to part in the morning from each other. Like that's kind of the idea. It's kind of like a sad morning poem. But I kind of take this um, and apply it again to this rowing lens because in rowing, obviously, it's a it's a morning sport. <laughs> you get up really early. You get on the river, and uh, yeah. So it starts with. Uh, a quote from Adrian Rich uh, from a poem called A Walk by the Charles that she wrote. Livia actually sent me this quote, which inspired the poem. <laughs> She's right there. Is she here? So Adrian Rich is right there on the bookshelf. She's here. So okay. Okay. You can see her. Oh! Yeah, she's been there. <laughs> yeah, okay, Adrian's here. Um, so pretend that she's talking when I say this. Um, Leave off your bending to the oar, and glide past innocence beyond these aging bricks to where the Charles flows in to join the sticks. I come to you in early morning. I walk the footbridge over Sturrow Drive, and you call to me, gouge your hook into my spine. I can never resist your gravity. Through a boat, I touch your waters and welcome the rising sun, revel in the flames glinting off you, illuminating bodies bent mid-stroke, single-file shadows in stark relief against the ribs of bridges. The searing images engrave my mind as well as the concrete, like glyphs of ancient caves. Yet I find myself in deeper danger as I glance over the gunwale and see your gentle eyes reflect back at me. Young and enamored, call me vain. Know when winter comes, I'll lie next to you. Rest an arm on your still icy plain, hips pressed close to your banks. I'll wait for spring to wake you, for our love is much older than us. I want to stroke your purling face in an endless echo, row to where the seasons halt, and your touch makes us invulnerable as the dawn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm in love with the river, guys. Um, in love with the water, always. Um, so I'll read one last poem here. Uh, hopefully this one will also hit home with you guys in the current state of the world. Um, this poem is called Corona Rowing. When it comes to boat moving, I know a thing or two. Boat feel is a sixth sense. Balance, rhythm, and timing. The coxswain's voice soon becomes your conscience. A thing or two, you feel the boat best in stroke seat of an eight. Nine bodies, voices, soon become your conscience. Shoes on the dock, the only trace of us. Put me in stroke seat of an eight. My body's happy place, my one mind home. We leave our shoes on the dock, our only trace. But take big boats away. What are you now? Not so happy anymore. Home is empty, and you're flipping singles in the Charles. What's a girl to do when big boats are gone? Land legs grown too fond, small, fragile, bruised. You're flipping singles in the Charles because you don't know how to read wind. Your sea legs are lost. The bruises fade, but the memories and voices do not. You don't know how to read wind, and small boats get scary in big water. No memories, voices to guide you along. The river is long, and the basin's deep. Big water gets scary when you're all alone. Balance, rhythm, coxswain, where are you? The river is long. The basin's deep, and when it comes to boat moving, I thought I knew. Thank you.
Keen is the author of Honey in My Hair and a review writer for Gasher. Her writing has found homes in the Academy of American Poets, BOAAT Journal, Entropy Magazine, Tinderbox, Whale Road Review, and elsewhere. She earned her MFA at Emerson, where she is now affiliated faculty and program coordinator, coordinator for Emerson, Emerson Writes. It's my pleasure to welcome Livia Menekin. Thanks for being here. It's in the cold. I'll take that off for now. Um, I always like to acknowledge that where I'm reading, so we are in the earlier. We're also on Massachusetts land. Um, a lot of these poems come from um, spaces on Turtle Island, on Indigenous land, others not. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from my book. Um, some poems from a collection that will hopefully find a home soon, and then some poems that are a little bit angrier, if that's okay, and I haven't found a place for them yet. Um, right. This is the, I, I like to start with this poem, it's the first poem I wrote when I spent a summer in Greece, which is inspired pretty much this entire collection. Um, this is the first, first poem I wrote, so I will start from the oldest and then we'll work our way to the present. It's called Courage. The leaves glowed exceedingly green the day grief was outmuscled by the sea. And you, the last person to ever come to a conclusion about the beauty of stillness, marveled at their courage. Only you can see how simultaneously sacred and wild the clouds are, and the sea, and you, so close to tasting the time, to knowing whether or not heaven exists, you are among life. Every morning, you see stars out your window. You are near God, and green, and the sea, and the end, and you don't know. The next two poems I'll read from here are for dear friends. One of them is a cat, one of them is a person. <laughs> <laughs> this is Artemis the Stray. Artemis the Stray stalks cautiously on the gravel, each step strained and stinging like the essence of lemon. She, white with reptilian eyes, is wounded. Still she hunts, my god, she must under the moon each night, but no longer in the wildlands. She weaves through table lights. The restaurant is nothing without her, and without us, so is she. Um, this poem is for my friend Joanna. Um, there's a, a, some Greek in here. Uh, I, I pretty much translate all the phrases, so you'll, you'll, know, you'll hear them, what they actually mean, um, or their place names. Freedom is a woman from Kipros. She can swim the Achaio, smell the pine of Thassos in her hair, and still remember her father. When sailboats look like seagulls, she still dances the Zambekiko better than any man because she understands what a cage is. Freedom held my face and said, you have so much power, you have nothing to fear. She looked into my eyes with the Akronihi Akapi, an eternal love that wrinkled her tan skin. She kissed my cheek and stroked my hair knowing I was crying on the inside. Then Eochistofovo cried the Greek people in the streets of Thessaloniki, say no to fear. Freedom walks within the crowds and within the wounds. And her name, Joanna's last name means freedom in Greek, or it comes from the word, Eletherio, comes from the word for freedom. 
This poem is called Towards the South, Past St. Ives. So we're now in the west, southwestern part of England on your map, mental maps. Past weather-worn bluffs, and farther than any bird known, the swift steps sleeps on the wing, leaving grief behind, swallowed by a willow and reborn green. I can still feel the moment she left my hands, tiny talons pushing off my palms, glossy plumage shrinking in a bright, blinding sky. Her body, dark, sharp, and quiet, only a speck off the sun. I bite into a pear, sitting in the arms of an elm with eyes aimed at the coastline. Juice sticks to my fingers as I reach the core. I spot her, maybe, past silent clouds, past all the days I've spent waiting. She will never come. Um, this is a little sonnet. I've been obsessed with them. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, it's. Is that all I want to say about it? Oh, I guess I'll just say to the. I'll just say on it that um, speaking. To, actually, speaking to Sarah's comment, um, sometimes folks read my writing and they assume it's real, and it is, but it isn't. Um, and so this poem kind of directly addressed that. It's called, Are All the Past and Future Loves in My Poem Real? If by real, you mean as real as a ladybug climbing up your shirt with six badges dotting determination on its back, or as real as the tattered eyes of birches lining a lake watching, then yes, every last page is true every line, image, and confession, every she, every green. But they aren't factual, no. Imagine spending so much time in love, all those trees and long walks, collecting violets to fill vases of petals as bees and butterflies come out from hiding spots, being kissed from sun up till far past dusk, when finally, that little red beetle reaches your lips. Um, this next poem is called Low Tide. It's about the North Shore. Um, and I just want to blurb. It's published in an mag online magazine called Entropy. And they officially closed at the end of December. So um, they have amazing work on their website that will like shut down at the end of this year. So Entropy is great. Love them. <laughs> Look at all their stuff or and download it before their website shuts down at the end of this year. Um, love them. That's called Low Tide. And I guess it would be worth mentioning. It's formatted as a very long column, like justified evenly on both sides. Seagulls gather, plovers gather, geese gather. Cloudy day, some sun, an old woman walks an old dog. Cold water, a little wind. I sit alone, I talk to my sister on the phone. I stand to kick a soccer ball up a slope of sand, brine, smashed shells, a small white crab, seaweed. She tells me about what it's like to be by herself. I listen. The ball gets stuck. A gull cries. I turn around. It floats, a crab in its mouth. 10 feet, 20 feet, the bird drops the crab, hovers back down. 10 feet, 30 feet again. Fragile creature falling, white caps farther out, blue, the bird returns to the shoal, rises yet again, 20 feet, 40. I don't know if the crab is, just isn't dead or won't come out of its carapace.
Um, I wasn't going to read this, but I think I will. Um, this poem is a choose-your-own-adventure poem, so essentially formatted. Um, there are options and parentheses for you to choose. As the reader, I'm just going to pick whatever comes to me. Um, but it can be depending on what you pick, silly or not. <laughs> it's called Decisions. And <laughs> I will say, actually I wrote this because <laughs> 15 minutes before a workshop I realized I had to submit something. <laughs> 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 and that has never, that's never happened to me. I'm like so type A. And I was just like, oh, what do I write about? And I was like, what if I write about like not knowing what to write about? And I just leave a <laughs> bunch of options. <laughs> yeah. It's called Decisions. There is a rhino in the rose garden. And however full it may be, consider the curious way she admires the hummingbirds, hummingbirds hovering and the air now saturated with clementines. Stand at the edge of the garden, however it may be, until you decide you need to leave instead. But while you're here, I can paint one of the untouched flowers for you. I've got one untouched canvas left, right here in my bag, see? And I can use whatever colors you'd like. Tell me, what will you remember most after you leave? Salt streaked limestone? Green moss on holy wells? Me? I can't decide if I can't stand you anymore. I usually go to the rose garden for the rhino's company. But I think I just want you to want me to be here too. Right, I'm going to read two more, if that's all right. These are the, I'm not angry. I've been through a lot in the past year, as many of us have, and I think I've kind of learned that sometimes, I don't know, it sounds very comfy the way I'm going to say it, but sometimes bad things need to happen so you can feel better. Sometimes you need to separate yourself from something to feel more whole. Um, so I tried writing about that a lot for the second collection that, I'm, that I'm, I've put together and I'm sending out. Um, this one is uh, called After a Black Kite Seizes Her Prey Midair. And I want to preface for you all, since folks in my workshop didn't get this, a kite is a bird. <laughs> it is not the thing that you fly. It's a small hawk. <laughs> How do you spell it? Kite. Just regular kite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah, and it's, um, these are huzzles, and there are four. I will just read one, the first one. I also find these, I'm challenging myself to read more of these out loud because uh, one of the features is to put your name in it. And that makes me feel really uncomfortable saying my name out loud in, in such a way. So I'm going to practice. <laughs> what wills to live must be lonely at night, leaving behind a deaf chasm of night. Suspended within keen talons, a bat surrenders all expectation of night. The strawberry skull, nearly weightless, releases a last echo at midnight. Who counts all the stars offered by darkness? The outcast steers silently through the night. She glides as if completely unthreatened. She relies on the ambiguity of night. A drummer strikes the air, mourning the victim's limp, nectar fingers all night. Consider, Livia, the gap that remains. What humid emptiness. What a nightmare. Uh, 
Um, this last poem was, um, I had a surgery two years ago, and then my place of employment decided to move virtually, then summer, then in the fall I said, hey, can I still do this virtually? And they were like, no. And I'm like, a lot, like, I physically am scared. And they were just like, no. So, um, this is a, this is, the title is, Reply to a COVID-Related Reasonable Accommodation Decision Notification Letter. My hospital gown was cyan. The therapy poodle, Toby, didn't need one because he was a dog. <laughs> Only for humans in need of resources. In need of nine hours under. My mother helped me undress for my first shower post knife. The bathroom was cyan, but sadder. Sunlight slipped past steam, refracting against the tile. I turned to hide my breasts, lifted my shirt inch by inch as her hands assisted the cloth. She checked the temperature of the water, warm. Are you all right, sweetheart? I should note, this poem is an anti-sonnet because it does not express love. I want to make my reply clear. Because I learned how to write here, at this college. Did you know cyanide has a bitter almond color, a odor? Imagine a rotting at your fingertips as you beg for nutrition. Golden brown turning green on your tongue and it's too late to turn back and the tree tells you that you always had the choice to walk away. Forgive me for not believing the college cares. Your letter says you reviewed documentation submitted by my physician, says this decision is limited, says my request to teach completely online is denied. Did you know when you take a radiation pill, everyone leaves the room to observe you swallowing through a window? Any future requests will be evaluated independently. So I only have one question, thanks for asking. If a dog eats one chocolate-covered almond, just one, will he be all right or turn a pale blue as the process is completed? Thank you. so much for that beautiful reading. We have uh, time for a couple of questions. If anyone has any questions to ask mm -hmm. the poets, would you all want to stand here and get some chairs? Sure. Standing feels good. Standing feels good. <laughs> <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> well, I have a question. What was it like to go to a poetry MFA program? It was great. I, I mean, <laughs> after that last sure poem. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, mean in relation to that. But. Well, it's kind of I'm going to share our first class. Can I tell that? Oh, story? yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we met each other in our both of our first classes at um, our MFA program. And we, like, were put in pairs, and the professor told us to, like, share what do you like to read. And we both looked at each other, and we were like, I don't really I don't read a lot of poetry. <laughs> um, I read fiction, or I read nonfiction. So I... I can't say how much I found myself in that program. Um, for anyone out there interested, um, it's really what you put into it, um, and I, um, which is like good and bad. But I have read so much, I've learned so much, I've grown so much just as a person. I know that's like kind of a cliche, but um, getting a chance to try new things. We've been in amazing workshops, even with the Boston Poet Laureate, uh, Portia Laiola. Mm -hmm. um, you just, you might have your thing, and then you're in class with someone who does something like, I would say our poetry is fairly similar, just in terms it's very inspired by place. Um, but you're put in rooms with people who are just so their style is so different from you, and like you lean on that and you learn from them, and I just think that's super rad. Yeah, yeah. 
No, I agree with everything that Livia just said. And a lot of people, when I was thinking about applying to MFA programs, they dissuaded me from doing it because not only of like the financial cost, but just like, well, mostly because of that. <laughs> Access <laughs> needs to be better. <laughs> yeah, but like, but I had a passion for it. I've been writing since I was 12, and I knew that like I wanted to publish a collection of poetry. I want to continue publishing, and I want to be able to learn from other poets and to read other types of poetry. And I feel like the way for me to commit and do that in the most like effective mm -hmm. and productive way was to get into a program that allowed me to to do that. And I definitely have read like so much and a lot of poets have really inspired the way I write and my own ideas about what I want to write in the future. Um, and I, that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been a part of this program. So, mm -hmm. and the people are really great and our professors are top notch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the form, I guess this is more about just your process, like do you have an idea for like a concept and you just kind of put down ideas and then figure out the form later or do you like know what you're trying to get in terms of, there are so many words out there that I've never heard, like a double, whatever, it's like <laughs> I'm not in this world super um, closely so I'm just curious if like you know what you're going for form wise going in or if that comes later. Do you want me to go first? Okay. Uh, yeah, so I didn't really experiment a lot with form in poetry until grad school, I would say, just because I didn't actually know about a lot of forms. Mm -hmm. um, so once I started reading them, we, there was a class that our professor Dan Tobin taught called Form in Poetry, literally, and we just learned about sonnets, sistinas, high buns, uh, villanelles, like all the really tough ones. And I found that I really wanted to try every single one of them. Uh, but one thing that Dan also says is that the, the form suits the content sometimes, right? So if you, if you want to write a sonnet, it's probably going to be about love or like, you know, some other, depending on what the history of the form is, like if you have an idea and you can kind of like fit it to whatever form kind of suits it, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I sometimes like a poem comes to me and I just write it free verse, but then you might redraft it. You're like, oh, this could be a cool guzzle or like a cool, like, you know, sonnet or some other type of form. Um, I, I can't say that I always go out and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to write a sestina. Uh, although I did Except do that. You did that. I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Except you did that. Except you definitely did that. <laughs> Because in our first workshop, like, oh, I didn't know what a Sestina was, and Dan told us what a Sestina was, mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm going to submit it for my first workshop, and everybody was like, you're not chill. Like, that's, <laughs> it is a really hard form, and like, but I wanted to try it and mm -hmm. fit my own content into that form. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's kind of like a puzzle, but at the same time, like, um, you kind of have to be aware of, like, what, what might suit different types of forms based on their histories, if that makes sense. I, I would say I'm the opposite. I'm a big form, formal person, but I have read folks like Terrence Hayes, um, Jericho Brown, and people who are taking form as like the start, and then like, how, what if what I have to say doesn't fit into that box? How can I change the box? So it's helpful to, uh, again, I, I think I've said uh, I'm a very type A person. Um, I like neat lines. I like organization but then sometimes this needs to be longer <laughs> or like I can't think of a rhyme I really want to use this word or um, so the form can break and I think that's exciting I also think form can help you generate so the example that I just gave oh I can't think of a rhyme well like it, what if it gives me the word cyan you know what if it gives me you know different more spe specific words if I really think harder because it has to fit in the box. So it's a game and you kind of play back and forth. Um, I think form is super helpful to be generate, to help you generate, but it also can be limiting and we should challenge, especially forms that are, you know, patriarchal. Like let's, let's push against that. Like what's a sonnet? I don't want to think of Shakespeare. I want to think of Terence Hayes. Like that's what I want to think of first. Um, and what if I want to include other languages? What if I, like, let's ask ourselves those questions and, and see form as just the, well, just one stepping off point into something new. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question.
that I tried writing duplexes many times. I also tried to write it. Oh, there is a duplex in this book, actually. Um, I have also failed, though. That <laughs> actually might not be a good duplex. I don't know. It is a new form. Uh, but like in terms of creating your own form? So I, I have, um, if I may. No, please. Um, in what will be my third book, so not the book that I'm shipping out or shopping for, but what's next. I've kind of written, and it sounds like you, Gary, you have familiarity with, with these like poetry. Um, I'm writing a sonnet, heroic sonnet crown, but they are all contrapuntals. <laughs> so you want to die? <laughs> so <laughs> so they are poems that can be read. They're in columns, two columns that can be read across or down. And they have to be 14 lines. That's me calling it a sonnet. And the last line will be the first line of the next. So there's again talk about a for, like talk about constraints, right? Like all these things holding it in a box. Um, and I wrote it. It probably isn't great, but I like tried it. So for me, if I can invent a form, it starts from meshing things together, like the duplex. So I tried that out. Maybe when I read it again, or if I ask someone else to read it, <laughs> they'll be like, don't do this. <laughs> but it's just playful. No, that's really cool. I, I agree with the whole meshing idea. Like, take what's been out there and, like, smush together and see what happens. Uh, I also, it's my goal to write a sonnet crown at some point. Maybe not even using sonnets. Maybe, like, using some other form. Like a, so that's, that's something on my mind. That definitely is, like, a longer project. But I can't say that I've ever tried to... I know Rajiv, like one of our professors at Emerson, um, he'll be here. He's coming here. Right? Yeah, reading February 4th. Rajiv! Yeah, Rajiv! Rajiv. He created his own form in like his latest book, yeah. I think. Yeah. So he might be more well-equipped to answer that question, but yeah. What would you do? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Puntal, but you can read it back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Hmm. Cool. Wonderful. Well, let's give the poets another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Our next reading is on Friday with Ralph Cover Cover, excuse me, and Bianca Stone. It'll be both in person mm -hmm. and virtual. There's still some spots for both. And um, tonight the poets will be signing books. Yep. Books are for sale over here. Thank mm -hmm. you everybody for coming. I hope you enjoyed this evening. Thanks for coming out in the fall. Thank you. We really appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> it's a bummer Angela couldn't be here. Mm -hmm. but They'll read again in the future. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.